It wasn't long after the wedding before you were you became pregnant. What was your reaction when you learned that the child was a boy? Enormous relief. I felt the whole country was in labour with me. <laughs> and enormous relief. But I had actually known William was going to be a boy because the scan had shown it, so it was no surprise. Had you always wanted to have a family? Yes, I came from a family where there were four of us. So we had enormous fun there. And then William and Harry arrived. Fortunately, two boys. It would have been a little tricky if it had been two girls. But that in itself brings responsibilities of bringing them up. William's future being as it is, and Harry a sort of like a form of a backup in that aspect. How did the rest of the royal family react when they learnt that the child that you would have was going to be a boy? Mm. Well, everybody was thrilled to bits. It has been a quite a difficult pregnancy. I hadn't been very well throughout it. So by the time William arrived, it was great relief because it was all peaceful again, and I was well for a time. Then I was unwell with postnatal depression, which no one ever discusses postnatal depression. You have to read about it afterwards. And that in itself was a bit of a difficult time. You'd wake up in the morning feeling you didn't want to get out of bed, uh, you felt misunderstood, and um, just very, very low in yourself. Was this completely out of character for you? Yes, very much so. I've never had, a, never had had a depression in my life. But then when I analysed it, I could see that the changes I'd made in the last year had all caught up with me, and my body had said, we want a rest. What was the, the family's reaction to your postnatal depression? Well, maybe I was the first person ever to be in this family who ever had a depression, or was ever openly tearful. And obviously that was daunting, because if you've never seen it before, how do you support it? What effect did the depression have on your marriage? Well, it gave everybody a wonderful new label. It's Diana's unstable, and Diana's um, mentally imbalanced. And unfortunately, that seems to have stuck on and off over the years. According to press reports, it was suggested that it was around this time Things became so difficult that you actually tried to injure yourself. Mm. Is that true? Mm. When no one listens to you or you feel no one's listening to you, all sorts of things start to happen. For instance, you have so much pain inside yourself that you try and hurt yourself on the outside because you want help, but it's the wrong help you're asking for. People see it as crying wolf or attention seeking, and they think because you're in the media all the time, you've got enough attention, inverted commas. But I was actually crying out because I wanted to get better in order to go forward and continue my duty and my role as wife, mother, Princess of Wales. So, I, uh, yes, I did inflict upon myself. I didn't like myself. I was ashamed that I couldn't cope with the pressures. What did you actually do? Well, I just hurt my arms and my legs. And I work in environments now where I see women doing similar things, and I'm able to understand completely where they're coming from. I've been here for a number of years. And that's like a secret disease you inflict it upon yourself because your self-esteem is to low ebb and you don't think you're worthy or valuable. You fill your stomach up four or five times a day, some, some do it more, and it gives you a feeling of comfort. It's like having a pair of arms around you, but it's temporarily, temporary. Then you, you're disgusted at the bloatedness of your stomach and then you bring it all up again. And it's a, it's a repetitive pattern which is very destructive to yourself. How often would you do that on a daily basis? Depends on the pressures going on. If I'd been on an, what I call an away day, where I'd been up part of the country all day, I'd come home feeling pretty empty because my engagements at that time would be to do with people dying, people very sick, people... marriage is the problem, all that, and I'd come home and it would be very difficult to know how to comfort myself, having been comforted lots of other people. So it would be a regular pattern to jump into the fridge. It was a symptom of what was going on in my marriage. I was crying out for help, but giving the wrong signals. And people were using my bulimia as a coat on a hanger. They decided that was the problem. Diana was unstable. And so you subjected yourself to this phase of binging and, and vomiting? You could say the word subjected, but it was my escape mechanism, and it worked for me at that time. Did you seek help from any other members of the royal family? No. You, 
you have to know that when you have bulimia, you're very ashamed of yourself and you hate yourself. So, um, and people think you're wasting food. So it doesn't, you don't discuss it with people. And the thing about bulimia is your weight always stays the same. Whereas with anorexia, you visibly shrink. So you can pretend the whole way through. There's no proof. The biography of the Prince of Wales, written by Jonathan Dimbleby, which, as you know, was published last year, suggested that you and your husband had very different outlooks, very different interests. Would you agree with that? No. I think we had a great deal of interest. We, were both, we both liked people, both liked country life, both loved children, um, work in the cancer field, work in hospices. But I was portrayed in the media at that time, if I remember rightly, as someone, because I hadn't passed any O-levels and taken any A-levels, I was stupid. And I made the grave mistake once of saying to a child I was thick as a plank in order to ease the child's nervousness, of which it did. But it, that headline went all around the world. And I rather regret saying it. <laughs> the Prince of Wales, in, in the biography, is described as a great thinker, a man with a tremendous range of interests. What did he think of your interests? Well, I don't think I was allowed to have any. I think that I've always been the 18-year-old girl he got engaged to, so uh, I don't think I've been given any credit for growth. And, my goodness, I've had to grow. <laughs> Around 1986, again, according to the biography written by Jonathan Dimbleby about your husband, he says that your husband renewed his relationship with Mrs Camilla Parker Bowles. Were you aware of that? Yes, I was. But I wasn't in a position to do anything about it. What evidence did you have that their relationship was continuing, even though you were married? A, a woman's instinct is a very good one. <laughs> so you were isolated? Mm-hmm. Very much so. Do you think Mrs Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us in this marriage. So it was a bit crowded. By the December of that year, as you say, you'd agreed to a legal separation. Mm -hmm. What were your feelings at the time? Deep, deep, profound sadness. So we'd, we had struggled to keep it going, but obviously we'd, all, we'd both run out of steam. And in a way, I suppose it could have been a relief for us both that we'd finally made our minds up. But my husband asked for separation and I supported it. It was not your idea? No. Not at all. I come from a divorced back up background and I didn't want to go into that one again. What happened next? We, I, I asked my husband if we could put the announcement out before the children came back for school for Christmas holidays because they were protected in the school they were at. And he did that. And it came out on December the 9th. I was on an engagement up north. I heard it on the radio. And it was just very, very sad. Really sad. A fairy tale had come to an end. And most importantly, our marriage had taken a turn. A different turn. Do you think the Prince of Wales will ever be king? Mm. I don't think any of us know the answer to that. And obviously it's a question that's in everybody's head. But who knows? Who knows what fate will produce? Who knows what circumstances will provoke? But you would know him better than most people. Mm. Do you think he would wish to be king? There was always conflict on that subject with him when we discussed it. And I understood that conflict because it's a very demanding role, being Prince of Wales, but it's equally a more demanding role, mm. being king. And being Prince of Wales produces more freedom now and being king would be a little bit more suffocating. And because I know the character, I would think that the top job, as I call it, would bring enormous limitations to him. And I don't know whether he could adapt to that. Would it be your wish that when Prince William comes of age that he were to succeed the Queen rather than the, prince, the current Prince of Wales? My wish is that my husband finds peace of mind and from that follows other things, yes. <laughs>